so as usual, a couple of announcements today. Um, the first one is actually here. This is the chemistry department seminar, 3.15 this afternoon, on stem cells and stem cell toxicology. The other announcement is that those of you who haven't signed up for the biology department Facebook page should, um, and why uh, has to do with this amazing opportunity here, which is you, know, you can win one of the new 2016 PSU biology mugs. But the important thing here is that you can write a haiku about your favorite biology professor. <laughs> No extra credit points here at all. Um, this is the first one which has been submitted here. A zebrafish swims, a mug holds coffee and tea, Brown gave me a B. <laughs> so um, really quite impressive. So I'm sure you'll need something else to do instead of studying. You'll be fed up with something. Um, this would be potentially a place to let those <clears throat> ideas go free. So today um, we're going to continue talking about translation. But first, of course, we have to have everybody's favorite part of lecture, um, which are clicker questions. And given what you know about transcription in Archaea, you expect that Archaea use a different RNA polymerase for rRNA and mRNA genes. Archaea have multiple rRNA genes. The Archaeal CTD brings splicing and tailing machinery with it. The genetic code in Archaea is different than that in bacteria, or yeah, Stedman's favorite, all the above. The genetic code is different. So genetic code being ATG is going to code for this, or GGG is going to code for that, et cetera. And it'll be different between archaea and bacteria. The genetic code in archaea is different than in bacteria, i.e., what you have as a codon in one set of organisms, say bacteria, is different than in archaea. So you've got you know, one, you know, whatever those three nucleotides are, are different in terms of what amino acid they code for. So that genetic code thing that I had last time is different between archaea and bacteria. Should we maybe restart this? Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's go ahead and do it again. It is Friday, yes. Um, I, will just, I will delete your first answer. So if you answer the first time, you still need to answer again this second round. I forgot the clicker in my other jacket. Can okay. Wait, tell you an answer? No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, for the record, my guest is sitting. Mm -hmm. Ten. Five, four, three. A few more votes. Good. So we're <clears throat> split, actually, about one-third, one-third, one-third between the first three results here, A, B, and C. Um, nobody likes the genetic code is different in archaea than in bacteria. That's good, because it isn't. Um, and that means that all of the above is definitely not a possibility. So <clears throat> that leaves us with A, B, and C. 
How many RNA polymerases for messenger RNA, or for that matter, ribosomal RNA, are there in archaea? One. One. So they're not different ones. They can't be different ones. So A is out. Um, does that one polymerase have a CTD? No. So what does that leave you with? B. Um, but that also makes sense because, as we talked about last time, ribosomal RNAs, you need a whole bunch of because it's that RNA which is active. You can't reamplify it with translation. So it turns out that in all organisms, you need multiple ribosomal RNA genes. So that's <clears throat> that is the correct answer is B. And most of you got it. Well, I'll get the. It's not the most, but the most people who voted then got that right. So <clears throat> hopefully this next one will be more straightforward. How many amino acids are encoded by one and only one codon in a standard genetic code, which we just found out is in bacteria and archaea? One, two, three, four, or six? Yeah, I skipped five. Oh, start? Nah, what's that all about? You didn't want to vote anyway, did you? <laughs> Gave you some more time. Twenty, fifteen, ten, five, four, three, two, one. We have liftoff. Uh, so, what are the two amino acids that are? Methionine and tryptophan, yes. And that's why it's in the standard genetic code. Um, I did mention last time that there are a couple of exceptions. And in some bizarre organisms, there are some slight differences. That's why I specifically said the standard genetic code here. So um, it is B. Yay. OK. So <clears throat> that being said, let's talk about how you go from the standard genetic code to specific amino acids. And that's all about amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Amino acyl tRNA synthetases are basically what takes that tRNA and says, hey, this is the tRNA that has to have a amino acid that's associated with it. Since there are 20 normal amino acids. Turns out they're about 23, but we'll talk about some of those a little bit later on. But as far as the normal amino acids, there are 20 of them. So you need 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because you have to have 20 different amino acids, right? Well, turns out that that's not completely true. Um, and there are some really bizarre cases. And this actually comes up from genome sequencing, literally in the last 10 years or so. People sequenced genomes, whole genomes of organisms, and then found that some organisms actually only add 19 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, or 18 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which is really bizarre. And if you're interested, talk to John Perona in the chemistry department. He'll tell you all about why that is. Uh, but because you only have approximately 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, and this is true again for most organisms, that means that these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because there are more tRNAs 
than 20, even with the wobble bases, you have to have more tRNAs, <coughs> then a number of these amino acyl tRNA synthetases can bind to multiple different tRNAs, because that's what the anticodons are going to be. So here is a really nice example of an X-ray crystal structure, and I think this may even be from John Perona's group, um, of an amino acyl tRNA synthetase together with a tRNA. And here would be where your anticodon is. It's going to bind to the codon. And up here is where your amino acid is. So let's look at what happens here in order to get the amino acid onto the tRNA. Yes? That's exactly on this slide, what it does. <laughs> so, great. Actually, it's a good question. What does it do? Because I'm like, why are we talking about it? <laughs> what, what's the point? Why is he bothering to waste our time with this? Um, so, no, what the amino acyl tRNA synthetases do is put an amino acid onto the correct tRNA. And this is very important that's the correct one as well. In the process, they also activate the amino acids so that they can be attached to other amino acids in order to make the protein. And how that happens is in two steps, not surprising, because there are two things that they do. The first one is to activate the amino acid. And surprise, surprise, here's our friend ATP that helps with that, and basically makes a high energy interaction between your amino acid and to start with AMP. So and again, it's hydrolyzing pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate goes to monophosphate. So you get your unidirectionality of the reaction here. This activated or also adenylated amino acid, and that's where the AA comes for, from, excuse me, um, the <clears throat> amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So this is an adenylated, it's an acyl group that then gets put onto your tRNA. Now this is an activated amino acid hooked up to the tRNA. So again, it's the amino acyl, acyl, excuse me, amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which have to both, let's get rid of this, uh, bind to <clears throat> the tRNA appropriately. It's got to bind down here, because this is where your anticodon loop is. This is what's going to determine which codon that tRNA is going to associate with. And then the amino acid, which is quite a long way away here. And so yeah, this end of the tRNA doesn't necessarily know what this end is doing. It's the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that does this. And it's just the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that does this. And we'll see how that is in, in just a second. And this is just a, another overview of how this works. We've got our amino acid here that gets linked to the tRNA through the C terminus. Again, just like proteins, amino acids themselves have an N terminus and a C terminus, hooked up to the C terminus. And now this tRNA can bind to a codon. As we all remember, this is your anticodon from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Here's the codon from 5' prime to 3'' prime in that direction. The amino acyl tRNA synthetases, again, have this really important job figuring out what tRNA and what amino acid to put on. Turns out that this is also quite challenging to do and even more challenging than what you see in the other kinds of reactions that we've talked about so far, polymerization. And the other reaction we've talked about is a nice base pair. You've got a nice base pair interaction. If the base pair is right, then it's good. But here, you've got to look at this amino acid, which again, it's a totally different chemical, totally different language. It's the amino acid language as opposed to the nucleotide language. So there are <clears throat> ways that these amino acyl tRNA synthetases also undergo proofreading, but now it really is the structure of that particular chemical, that particular amino acid, which is there. It's not an overall structure of your base pair. This is going to be the structure of an individual amino acid. So if it turns out that when the amino acyl tRNA synthetase puts on the incorrect amino acid, it chops it back off. And part of the reason that this happens is that 
lot of amino acids look pretty darn similar to each other. Um, tyrosine, for instance, is extremely similar to phenylalanine, just has this OH hanging off of it. Isoleucine and valine are extremely similar to each other. This one's just got one extra methyl group, but look, we got a bunch of methyl groups over here as well. And so that checking by the amino acid salt RNA synthetase, whether you've got the right amino acid attached there is very, very important. And the way that that works, turns out that this editing site only will bind to the incorrect amino acid. So if you look here, if you have a phenylalanine amino acyl tRNA synthetase, it can sometimes add tyrosine and sometimes add phenylalanine, but only tyrosine is going to get cut off because that's the only one that fits into the editing site. And the actual amino acylation site, we have this catalysis that takes place, either of them can go in. And this is true for the you know, very similar kinds of amino acids with each other. Of course, it's going to happen with phenylalanine and tyrosine. It's not likely to happen between leucine, because leucine wouldn't even bind here in the first place in order to be attached. Yeah? So which error site did you say um, only attaches to the, the wrong amino acid? Yeah, so the so-called editing site here. Sorry, I'll just... just so, Right, so it's the editing site here which will bind to the incorrect amino acid and chop it off. This active site where it puts on that amino acyl tRNA could put on the wrong one. But the wrong one will get cut off, the right one won't get cut off. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of, sort of? I mean, again, a lot of this comes from, literally, from the work of, of John Perona and some of the people that he's been working with. So, as I mentioned before, uh, it really is the amino acyl tRNA synthetases that are responsible for fidelity in translation. Everyone talks about, oh, it's the tRNA, the tRNA binding to the codon. Well, it turns out the tRNA binding to the codon and the ribosome have absolutely no clue what amino acid is attached to that tRNA. And the reason we know that is people have made normal tRNAs with the appropriate amino acid attached to them, with the appropriate anticodon here, and then chemically changed them. And now, if you have a reaction where you just take these tRNAs with an anticodon which should be coding for cysteine, the ribosome's going to put in alanine there. So it really is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase which is giving you that specificity. It's binding to your tRNA, putting on the right amino acid, which is there. So, yeah? So the question is, how does it know with the tRNA in terms of what amino acid is supposed to go there? So what happens, sort of diagrammed here in this structure, is the anticodon loop is down here. It binds to the specific amino acyl tRNA synthetase that is going to put the appropriate amino acid for that codon on there. And so it's a recognition by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase of the tRNA, and it's only going to be the correct amino acyl tRNA synthetase that recognizes that anticodon, turns out some extra pieces as well. So the tRNA recognizes the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, not the other way around. Well, okay, the, 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 so the, this is really kind of a semantic question. So which one recognizes what? It's not like a code preceding uh, the section where the amino acid is going to connect. It has to do with the anticodon at the bottom that it's searching out for something that it's finding. Maybe I'm not completely understanding your question, but I'll just try and describe it again. So the way that this works is you have an amino acyl tRNA synthetase and a tRNA without an amino acid on it. They then come together. And then you get the amino acid put on. So that's the process. Okay. Does, that, does that kind of answer your question? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> 
Hmm? Yeah, so what's happening here? The synthesis is making that covalent bond to your you know, amino acyl group. And so that's your amino group that comes in there. So synthesizing is adding on the amino acid. So the, maybe again, getting back to your question, if there was another panel in this figure right here, it would be the green amino acyl tRNA synthetase and just the blue tRNA without the red amino acid at the end of it. So first thing that happens is you have the protein associates with the nucleic acid. So protein amino acid tRNA synthetase, tRNA without an amino acid on it. Then the amino acyl tRNA synthetase puts an amino acid on. If it's the wrong one, it gets chopped off. If it's the right one, it doesn't get chopped off. And then that amino ace, uh, that now amino acylated tRNA, which has been made properly, now it will dissociate from the synthetase and go to the ribosome and make protein. Yeah? Right now, this part is being encoded on, but tRNA is bound to the synthetase? Correct, down here. And so that's how you get your specificity. That's how, so the, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase really is the one that's reading the genetic code. It says, hey, this is the tRNA that should have this particular amino acid on it, put it on. So it's really doing the job, yeah. Is there a different one for each sort of this amino acid or one molecule? Right, so the, the question here is, is there a different amino acyl tRNA synthetase for every, first every tRNA, and then second for every amino acid? And it turns out there are more tRNAs because there are more anticodons, even with wobble. Now it turns out that it's much more specific for the amino acid than it is for the, R, the tRNA. So you can have multiple different tRNAs that will have different sequences and different anticodons that still are going to have the same amino acid put up here. Um, and that's what I mentioned, the isoacceptor tRNAs here, which are going to have multiple tRNAs, but only one amino acid put down there. And that's the flip side of the clicker question that I asked is how many amino acids have six codons that get used for them? And so those will have at least a couple of tRNAs, even with wobble bases. Yeah? So the active sites would accept, say, tyrosine and phenylalanine. Correct. Because they're close enough that it recognizes that this is close enough to put on. And then if it wants to put on tyrosine, if it would have put on either one, and then it goes to the other side and makes it double only binds to the phenylalanine one, chop right. that off. Correct. Okay, so now we've got our amino acyl tRNAs. Happy with our amino acyl tRNAs? Happy tRNAs? Good? Again, amino acyl tRNA synthetases. What do they do? Well, now they've been made. Now they go to the ribosome, and you have this extension of the either single amino acid or multiple amino acids which are there. Just adding to the C-terminal end, this is your activated group here. So this now has <clears throat> reaction between the N-terminus and the C-terminus here. That then removes this bond right here. Now you've got your amino acid chain attached to this tRNA and so on and so forth. And so this whole process is moving along here. The important thing here is that this is now your active and activated, because that's the other thing the amino acyl tRNA synthetase does, does this for all of the amino acids, is gives you this bond here, which is now going to be available to be cleaved with this interaction here. So that's the extension cycle, and we'll see how that happens. It happens, of course, all on the ribosome. What is the ribosome doing? Ribosomes, as I think mentioned briefly last time, maybe it was just in office hours, uh, have to start at a particular place. Once they start, they've got to continue, and once they get to the end, they have to stop. And so this should be really familiar because we've talked about it for replication and transcription already. So you start out with the individual components. Here we've got our messenger RNA with a start codon and a stop codon, our two small and large subunits <coughs> of your ribosome. First thing that happens is a small ribosomal subunit associates with your messenger RNA. 
you get your initiator tRNA, then the large ribosomal subunit comes together. It's that large ribosomal subunit that has the activity of getting that reaction to take place. You remember that they've got the N-terminus of the individual amino acid that then gets hooked up to the C-terminus of the extending amino acid chain. So we have these together, then you have extension, this is your elongation phase, eventually you get to the end, termination, and you go back through this whole circle again and again and again. This is true for bacteria and eukarya. We'll talk about the differences as we uh, move forward here. So let's look at the various different parts of the ribosome. We talked about this a little bit already. Large and small subunits of the ribosome. They've got these funky names, 30S, 50S, 70S. That just has to do with where they end up in a centrifuge run. And so that's how people originally um, talked about them. The eukaryotic ribosome is slightly larger than the prokaryotic ribosome. When they say the prokaryotic ribosome here, this should really be bacterial ribosome because the, <coughs> excuse me, archaeal ribosome is actually more like the eukaryotic ribosome than the prokaryotic ribosome. Uh, so ADS, but as far as we're concerned, there's a large subunit and a small subunit. Large subunit is mostly made up of RNA and a few proteins, and these are those different RNAs. And we talked about the RNAs last time. We talked about ribosomal RNA processing. Start out as one big long RNA that gets chopped into smaller pieces and then modified. In the case of the eukaryotic large subunit, you've got this extra RNA that's made by RNA polymerase three. Um, small subunit RNA and a number of proteins. Again, all of these are named with S's on them, depending on where they centrifuge. Anything with a larger S number is going to be larger. The smaller S number will be smaller. Unfortunately, you can't add these things up. So 60S plus 40S equals 80S. So yeah, the mathematicians are not very good here. Do you have a question? Sorry. So the question has to do with membrane-bound ribosomes and free cytoplasmic ri ribosomes. That's a question for cell biology. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the actual ribosome, they are the same. They are identical. So yeah. Oh, so the number of proteins here. Yeah, approximately 33 proteins and approximately 34 proteins. Here it doesn't say approximately 49. Um, I would put approximately 49 here as well. And whenever it's something like approximately, Stedman shouldn't be asking a question like this on an exam. <laughs> However, <laughs> now that we're on this point, um, 18S, small subunit ribosomal RNA in eukaryotes, 16S ribosomal RNA, small subunit RNA, in bacteria, these are things I might expect you to know. In fact, I do expect you to know, but I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you a question about it. Uh, so these are, and we'll see why this is in, in just a second, because these are the really important, particularly the 16S ribosomal RNA, for getting translation to take place, and particularly starting translation. But for this point, we've got multiple RNAs that come together in the large subunit, one RNA in the small subunit, 18S for eukaryotes, 16S for bacteria. So <clears throat> what do these things actually look like? Okay, well, it's been 16 years since this was first published. So uh, there's been enormous progress in the last few years in terms of understanding the ribosome, mostly because people have managed to get now atomic resolution structures for now, in fact, the whole ribosome, although this was the first example of this. Um, this was in 2000 um, when this structure was published. This is the large subunit of the ribosome from Archaea. And no one says Archaea, not even in their paper. They don't even really say it's from Archaea. But the first ever ribosomal subunit to be crystallized came from Archaea. Um, you've got about a million of these per cell in eukaryotes. And we talked about this way back when we talked about the composition of cells and what the amounts of RNA are inside any given cell. The vast majority of RNA in any kind of cell is the ribosomal RNA because you need so much of it 
for translation. And if you look at the crystal structure here, atomic resolution, all of the yellow things are proteins, and all the gray is RNA. And this should give you a really good indication that it's really all about the RNA for the ribosome. The proteins are just sort of hanging in there um, and probably are not important for the actual function of the ribosome. And people have, in fact, taken out all of the proteins from the ribosome, and it still works. So it's just an RNA which is necessary for that. So that's better shown here. This is now the RNA and just the RNA for not just the large subunit, but the small subunit as well. They're kind of stacked on top of each other here. A little hard to tell. Um, but the main thing here is it's RNA, and I challenge you to tell me that's single-stranded. Come on. Uh, almost everything here is base pairs. So all these base pairing, they did throw this little extra protein in here, you know, poor little extra protein. Uh, but all of these different parts of RNA all fit together and give you the fundamental activity of transpeptidation. So taking one amino acid and adding it on to the next amino acid, and then the specificity of binding to the messenger RNA in order this ends up with a appropriate <clears throat> sequence of amino acids. So that was the large subunit of the ribosome. Now we put the small subunit on top of it. Down here at the bottom, we've got that large subunit that we're just looking at. Here's a small subunit. These are where three tRNAs are bound to the ribosome. There are three binding sites for tRNAs. And if you take this small subunit and flop it over on top of the large subunit, um, this is just the same set of three tRNAs, you'll see they're completely buried inside the ribosome, just completely squished down um, in the middle. And that's where all the business is taking place. Um, at the bottom of each of these, this is actually looking down into the top of the ribosome here. It's just rotated 90 degrees. Uh, at the bottom here is where the anticodons are, and the top is where all of your amino acids are. And this is usually how people will draw these as a cartoon. Um, EPA, it's not the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the exit site, the peptidation site, give you one guess what happens here, transpeptidation. Um, and the A site, which is where you have the amino acyl tRNA, which comes down and binds. When this is doing its thing, it cranks along. Eukaryotes are lazy as usual about 10 times slower than the bacteria, and then these are those three sites. So now I just wanted to take a quick look at animation of messenger RNA translation. This is again from our friends at the DNA Learning Center. This is now a tRNA, sorry, not tRNA, messenger RNA, which has been exported from the nucleus. Here it comes out of the nucleus. That's the nucleus over there. Here's your messenger RNA. This now needs to associate with a ribosome. And here's a ribosome. It started here at the 5' end of the <coughs> messenger RNA, and it's now moving along. Each of these green things floating around here is a tRNA with a red amino acid associated with it. And each of those red amino acids is slowly getting extended. So you get to a termination point, that protein is removed. Here's the small subunit of the ribosome binding at the 5' end. There's the large subunit. Once they're together, now they're moving along, and hopefully you can see that every three nucleotides there is moving through. Here are tRNAs, each of them with an amino acyl <coughs> group at the end, which is your amino group. These guys will associate with the ribosome, come into the A site here, the amino acyl site, transfer that amino acid, which is up here at the top, to the next tRNA and then be released. And so it's literally a chunking through process. This is now looking down between the large and the small subunits and again gives you an idea that all of this stuff is down, you know, here's your interaction down here, here's your transpeptidation which is taking place. If you look at where that transpeptidation takes place, it's all RNA 
right there. There's no protein anywhere near that particular um, transpeptidation site. Here's your protein as it's getting made. So not unlike what happens with the RNA polymerase, it gets pushed out of this complex and then <clears throat> gets um, folded. We'll talk more about protein folding later on here. tRNAs associating with the codons, again, through their anti-codon loop, and just extending as they go through here. There is an anima uh, sorry, a commentary that goes with this. It's connected to the YouTube animation, and you can take a look at it. It's really quite a good commentary as well. You can you know, see what I say relative to what it says, see if we agree with each other. Uh, so here's our ribosome moving along the messenger RNA, again, doing all of these extension processes. Once you get to a stop codon, we'll talk much more about stop codons in just a second, um, you will then stop making this polypeptide chain. That peptide is released, the subunit of the ribosome are released, and you start the whole process all over again. So that's translation in a nutshell, and particularly the elongation step of translation. Yes? So um, we talked a little bit last time, we talked about splicing, that you have cell splicing introns. It's just RNA. And so just the RNA has enzymatic activity. And that goes back to, we talked about really briefly before, we'll talk a little bit more about later on, is the whole concept of the RNA world when life first arose on this planet and maybe other planets. Um, and that is that it was probably RNA and just RNA that was there, because RNA can carry genetic information and it can have catalytic activity. So you don't actually need proteins. And you don't need DNA at all. You know, that, that comes probably much, much later. And so that's the idea of the molecular fossil here, is that it's the, the ribosome itself is all RNA because that's how it started, was just RNA. And the proteins were added later in terms of evolution, and evolution on a billion-year kind of time scale. And then the transpeptidation that you're referring to, what exactly is the specifically that referred to? So transpeptidation refers to this step right here. So where you have the, <clears throat> and as we'll see in just a second, this is going to be your amino acyl tRNA with the amino acid in the A site is going to make a peptide bond to what's in the P site right here, and that's where that reaction is taking place. So again, that was the elongation. <clears throat> elongation is great, but you've got to start somewhere. How do you start? And this is particularly important if you think about that whole structure where you've got the two subjects of the ribosome, which are just clamping down on those tRNAs. Well, how do you get the tRNA in there in the first place, particularly if it has to be in the P site? So the answer is, you have to have everything apart before it gets in there in the first place. So <clears throat> this is the case for your bacterial initiation. Turns out that eukaryotic initiation is slightly different. Um, what happens here is you have your messenger RNA, initiator tRNA. The small subunit of the ribosome binds to the messenger RNA, and then you get the initiator tRNA. And last time, maybe in just after class, we talked briefly about the fact that in some bacteria, you'll have a different start codon, CAU, U, uh, so, sorry, AUG is the normal start codon. Um, UUG and GUG can be used in some cases. Um, and we also mentioned that it, you can have different interactions at a methionine that starts a protein and a methionine which is later on in the throat protein. Turns out there's a different tRNA which is used for starting. And it's always a different tRNA which is being used. So that particular tRNA in bacteria has a modified methionine on it. And not surprisingly, there's also a different amino acyl tRNA synthetase that's involved in making this initiator tRNA. So the initiator tRNA, which does have methionine associated with it, then will associate to this complex, which is the small subunit of the ribosome, messenger RNA, 
Once all that's assembled, then you have the large sum unit that comes down. And so it just it hides that first tRNA and the first amino acid inside that, that clam structure. So let's zoom in and take a little bit closer look here at what's going on. The initiation site in bacteria, also called the ribosome binding site, or RBS, and I will write out ribosome binding site. Don't worry, I was just too lazy when I was writing the slide, and it takes up too much space. Um, the ribosome binding site is a thing on your messenger RNA that binds to the ribosome. So the ribosome is made mostly of what? RNA. What's one of the great things about RNA that we've talked about a whole bunch for splicing and for <laughs> modifications? Forms base pairs. So it turns out that the ribosome binding site on your messenger RNA base pairs with the small subunit of the ribosome, and particularly the 16S ribosomal RNA, the small subunit RNA that you have in bacteria. So there's a base pairing interaction in fact, very close to the 5' prime end of the small subunit RNA, which now base pairs specifically with the messenger RNA near the start codon. And particularly near, it's always going to be <clears throat> 5' prime to the start codon. Because if it were the other way, then you'd be going in the, the opposite direction, and this is not the same sequence. So your AUG is here. This is also called the Shine Delgarno sequence. And the reason it's called Shine Delgarno is because it was Mr. Shine and Mr. Delgarno who discovered this particular sequence. Um, and it's very well conserved in bacteria of a particular species. Turns out that different bacterial species have slightly different sequences in their 16S ribosomal RNA, and then will bind to slightly different ribosome binding sites or Shine Delgarno sites. So if you look at a typical messenger RNA in bacteria, we talked about this a little bit before when we talked about transcription and polycystronic, monocystronic messenger RNAs. Many messenger RNAs in bacteria code for multiple different proteins and completely different proteins, not just differential splicing or anything like that. So here you have in your messenger RNA multiple different ribosome binding sites, different spatially. Their sequences are going to be the same because they're going to have that shine delgarno sequence, which is going to base pair with the small subunit RNA in the ribosome. And once it binds here, there'll be an AUG. There's also going to be a stop codon right here, another ribosome binding site, next one, and next one, and next one. So you end up with, in this case, three different proteins from one messenger RNA because you've got these different ribosome binding sites. And one of the things that you see in bacteria, because bacteria don't have nuclei, is that as you are making your messenger RNA, as soon as that ribosome binding site is available, comes off of the RNA polymerase, the ribosomes can associate with it. And so you have transcription and translation happening simultaneously in bacteria. This is not the case in eukaryotes. Why? you got a nucleus. All transcription is happening in the nucleus. Translation is happening out in the cytoplasm. So it can't be happening co-transcriptionally. So again, another big difference between what's going on here. We'll talk a little bit about the specific bacterial initiation factors for translation. The function is very, very similar between these. You need the same kind of function in eukaryotes as well. The easy way, not that there's really an easy way to remember these things, um, is anytime you see IF, that's an initiation factor. And for eukaryotes, it's got a little E in front of it for eukaryotic initiation factor. And the IFs, these are always going to be initiation factors, and they're IFs are only for translation. And F just means what? Factor is a protein. So we've got three initiation factors in bacteria. Yeah? Uh, where does Archaea fit in there? Huh. <laughs> where does Archaea fit in there? Fabulous question. Um, very little is known about Archaeal translation. It's a wonderful, interesting field to study. Uh, if anything, they're more similar to the eukaryotic than they are to the bacteria. But 
archaea don't have your nucleus. So they also have co-transcriptional translation. So it's this kind of bizarre thing somewhere in between. Really fascinating question. Nobody has a good handle on that. I almost did a postdoc on that, but that's a different story. Then I got into viruses and, you know, that's the, the story is where it is now. So <clears throat> what if you look at now this initiation complex that you have between a bacterial messenger RNA and the small subunit of the ribosome, you've got all of these tRNAs, A site, P site, E site, but you also have these initiation factors. And the important things of these initiation factors, well, one, two, and three, um, IF2 is the most important one. We'll get those back to that in just a second. But IF1 binds to the A site in the small subunit of the ribosome because you don't want a tRNA binding there because if you did, then it wouldn't have the appropriate site. You really want to be pushing that initiator tRNA into the P site. And normally, you know, things don't bind in the P site. The tRNAs are going to always want to want to bind in the A site. So you need to block the A site. IF3 sits here in the E site, but more importantly, it blocks the large subunit of the ribosome from coming in. And why is that important? That's important because if the two subunits of the ribosome are together, there's no way you can get to the P site. That, I mean, that amino acyl tRNA can't get to the P site. So you have to hold the two subunits apart, make sure that the initiator tRNA binds to the P site and not bind to the A site. And then we have IF2. IF2, also EIF2, talk about it in just a second, it's having exactly the same activity, binds to your initiator tRNA in bacteria. This is the formal methionine, the separate initiator tRNA. It's also a GTPase. What do GTPases do? They hydrolyze GTP. Right, okay, yes. Uh, but what happens when they hydrolyze GTP? They have a structural change. And so it's that structural change which happens here when you've got everything put into the right place. And once everything's put into the right place, now you have GTP hydrolysis, a structural change. The IF2 is released. All the other proteins come off. Now you can assemble the ribosome and everything can take off. There are lots and lots of GTPases involved in translation. So that's the first one is this initiation factor two, which is making sure that you've got the initiator tRNA together at the P site in the ribosome. People have looked a lot at eukaryotic translation initiation. This is just a consensus sequence for what's going on in eukaryotic translational initiation. And basically it says here that 100% of the time you have AUG at plus one. And this would be actually, this would be a little bit smaller if we're talking bacteria. Um, but the important thing here is that you also have other amino, sorry, nucleotides around this starting site for translation that are also important for association. But one thing you'll notice here, this is not a shine dog honor sequence. There's no conserved sequence over here. It's a very different kind of structure on your messenger RNA for getting the start and the start to happen. Yeah? So the shine dog sequences. So the sequences are consensus sequences. You find them only in bacteria, however. And people actually thought that that was what was going on in eukaryotes, and then they looked and they couldn't find them. So, okay, what's going on here? But, of course, it makes sense if you think about the messenger RNA, which has been exported from the nucleus, and now you have to do translation on that. Instead of the shine dalgano sequence coming out of the RNA polymerase and being bound to immediately by the ribosome, now you've got this whole messenger RNA that's been spliced, you get all these extra proteins associated with it, which has been exported. That then needs to get associated with the small subunit of the ribosome and the initiator tRNA. So, what happens is you have, and this was in the animation, but it was really kind of very brief, is the small subunit of the ribosome here is already associated with the initiator tRNA. So in the absence of messenger RNA at all, but still has initiation factor two, only not the eukaryotic ones, it's got this little E in front of it. 
So UCAT initiation factor 2 together with GTP, together with your initiator tRNA, that, just like the case in bacteria, is going to wait until this initiator tRNA is at the right place before you have hydrolysis and the release of these other proteins, IF1 and IF3, which are doing exactly the same thing. IF1 is blocking the A site. EIF1A blocks the A site. EIF3 blocks large small subunit interactions. IF3 does the same thing. However, we've got a very different messenger RNA now. It's not the one which is coming off of the, the RNA polymerase directly. It's something which has been capped and tailed and spliced and so on and so forth. So now you have all of these specific eukaryotic messenger RNA binding proteins, <coughs> which are unfortunately confusingly called EIF4. But no, we didn't have four yet, so it's the next number we get to. Um, these are made up of, in fact, lots and lots of different factors, but the important ones are the ones that we put here in red, conveniently, just in case you might want to remember them. Uh, EIF4E binds to the cap. So it's the cap binding for translation. We had the cap binding complex. You remember that from last time? No, I can't remember it because it was like last time. Uh, that is important for getting your export. But as soon as your messenger RNA has been exported, that gets exchanged for EIF4E. So EIF4E binds to the cap structure. And then there's this EIF4G, which is kind of an adapter between the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end of your messenger RNA. And so what does it associate with? It associates with EAF4E because it's binding the cap. So that's your 5' prime end. And associates with a poly A binding protein over at the other end. And it makes your messenger RNA into a loop. And again, it wasn't shown in the animation, but the translated messenger RNAs in eukaryotes are almost always as looped structures. And the main reason for that is probably having to do with all the nasty exonucleases that would love to chew in at the ends of your messenger RNA. And so having a loop structure, those two ends together, there is no end. And so there's nothing that those exonucleases can actually get to. So you have this association here at the 5' prime end. This is still looped around over here. Then what happens is the small subunit of the ribosome, together with this initiator tRNA, translocates, i.e. moves along the messenger RNA, or the messenger RNA moves through it, until you get to the start codon. This requires ATP hydrolysis. So there's actually ATP hydrolysis that happens as this is moving along. Once it gets to the right place, now you have GTP hydrolysis, change in the structure of your initiation factor 2. EIF1 comes off, EIF3 comes off. Now you have the large subunit of the ribosome, and now you're ready to go. You've got an amino acyl tRNA in the P site, a free A site. Now you can have your next amino acyl tRNA that comes in and binds. Transpeptidation takes place, and then the ribosome will move. And so this is that process, just a slightly different way of looking at it. Again, here's our polypeptide chain attached to your tRNA that you have in the P site. Here's the tRNA bound in the A site. Transpeptidation takes place. You have translocation, which is movement of the ribosome relative to your RNA. Now the tRNA that was in the A site is in the P site. The tRNA that was in the P site is in the E site. It can now be removed, and you continue along through the process. So that's great. It's wonderful. Um, turns out it's actually too slow to get the whole thing moving properly. So there are, again, confusingly named factors that are involved in this process, which is the elongation process. So these are the EFs, it's the elongation factors. EFG, which is the bacteria, EEF2, which is what happens in eukaryotes, they do exactly the same thing, 
and basically I like to think of them as a little foot that comes in, binds to the large subunit of the ribosome, and just kicks the whole thing along through GTP hydrolysis. All this does is speeds up translocation. Translocation would happen, you get translation happening in the absence of these extra factors. It just speeds up the whole process. Yeah, there's a question here. is eukaryote. So EFG is bacteria. Anytime there's this little E here, that stands for eukaryotes. And at least the nomenclature is consistent on this, thank goodness. Um, so any small E is going to be eukaryote. Anytime it doesn't have a small E, it will be a bacterial process. How much faster does it make it? Um, it's about 10 times faster when you have those extra um, elongation factors. So <clears throat> you may have noticed here, this is a elongation factor two. What happened to elongation factor one? Well, elongation factor one, the eukaryotic elongation factor one, basically serves the same job as what happens with the initiation factor two, and that is make sure that you've got the right codon-anticodon pairing, that you have the right interactions with the tRNA, which is coming in now to the A site. And what that is, is you have your elongation factor, either EFTU in bacteria, or eukaryotic elongation factor one, that associates with the tRNA that's coming into the A site. If this is a correct base pairing interaction, then you have GTP hydrolysis, and you can follow through the process. If, on the other hand, it's an incorrectly base paired tRNA, that will fall off and you get a new one. And this is probably why translation is so darn slow compared to transcription and replication. You've got 20 different amino acids and more than 20 different codons or tRNAs that have to come in and bind to correctly at the A site. And one of the things that I like about that video which I showed is that multiple tRNAs end up coming in and out of the A site until finally you get the right one. When you finally get the right one, then you have the GTP hydrolysis with this elongation factor, and then you can get transpeptidation to happen. And so that's really the rate limiting step of translation is finding the right codon anticodon pairing to put in that next amino acid. So that's the, the slow process that's happening there. So we've talked about initiation. We've talked about elongation. What's next? Termination. So the last part, what happens here? And so the last two minutes, I just want to talk about this. Basically, what happens here is that instead of having a tRNA bind to the A site, there's no tRNA that binds to these stop codons. So there's no tRNA that's binding to the stop codon. What does the ribosome do? Well, it waits until there's a now a factor, i.e. a protein, not an RNA, that binds to the A site, and then basically tricks the ribosome into hooking this last amino acid up to water, and that now releases your polypeptide chain once you no longer have the polypeptide chain here, everything falls apart. So we'll just look really briefly at what these so-called release factors are called. Sorry, they're called RFs, not TFs. It'd be a lot easier for their TFs, but then you think of transcription, transcription factor. So R is release. R is going to be what happens at the very ends of translation. So release factor one, that it's an RF, no E before it, means it's what's happening in bacteria, and it basically looks a lot like a tRNA. And let's take a quick look actually at that structure here. This is one of the release factors. This is what the tRNA looks like. Um, and so they're very, very similar in terms of their structures. What happens with these release factors? Basically, all that they do is stimulate the hydrolysis of this peptide tRNA bond that's present at the P site. And again, just makes a bond to water instead of the amino acid which would be here in the first place. They have 
peptide sequences that look a lot like an anticodon, and the structure is very similar to RNA. Once you have these associations, you have a couple of other release factors. These release factors will bind to the first release factor, which is here again. They're GTPases. You have GTP hydrolysis that changes the structure here and basically allows the dissociation of the ribosome into its individual subunits. Um, we're not going to spend too much time talking about all of these individual release factors. The important one is that first one, which comes in and binds and then causes the ribosome to make this link to water. These guys are really important and fascinating, but we're not talking about them, so they're not going to be on the exam. So with that, is it a weekend already? How did that happen? Woohoo! Enjoy. <laughs>